you. Thank you. Is the Tea Party still a force in America? Yeah. When I was thinking about running for office, when I just started thinking about it, I went to a Tea Party April 15, 2009. I live in a fairly small town in Kentucky, and I went down to the square. I've been coaching my 10-year-old baseball game, and I said, I'm going to take three minutes off. I'll be 20 minutes on the back to follow where everybody will be there. I showed up expecting 20 people to be there. There were 700 people crowding our square. Many people in the beginning said, the Tea Party, oh, it's just a concoction of the news networks or some conservative in Washington. But it wasn't. And I think they're finally truly understanding that it isn't. It isn't created in Washington. It's everywhere across the country, city by city. Some people still don't get this. In Kentucky, Bowling Green has a Tea Party, and they don't always talk to Lexington's Tea Party. In fact, they don't always even know Lexington's Tea Party. That's the definition of a true grassroots movement that has sprung up and has really not yet coalesced into organizing by state and by country. Now, it's not entirely true. I know there are national Tea Party groups, and they are beginning to form statewide, and so I don't want to downplay that, but I want to emphasize the grassroots nature of this. Some said when people who came from the Tea Party were elected in Washington would co-opt us. Are we going to let that happen? No! The interesting thing is, is I think we we're already co-opting Washington. sworn in, the Republican caucus got together, this isn't my thanks, this is thanks to Senator DeMint, who's been working on this for years, they forced forward and said, no more earmarks. Now, are they going to co-opt us? I went to my first day of the union the other day, and guess who now is against earmarks? <laughs> <laughs> the President of the United States has been co-opted by the Tea Party. he's necessarily happy about it. I think he truly believes that government is the answer to all of our economic problems. He doesn't really truly believe what Reagan said in his first inaugural address, and that was that government is the problem, not the solution. But circumstances are making even those on the other side stand up. The circumstances are that we face incredible problems. The debt hangs. In my speech the other day, I said it hangs like the sword of Damocles above our heads. There's no way to escape it. We must do something. Yesterday on Fox News, Congressman Rangel said that the age for Social Security men to go up. We are co-opting the rest, or the problems are co-opting the rest, such that it is of such significance that they can't escape it anymore. And yet, we still have a lot of work to do. We've introduced a bill, my office has, that cut 500 million in spending. Most of official Washington, <laughs> most of official Washington thinks that's way too dramatic and we can never do it. But guess what? It's not enough. $500 billion, if we cut it tomorrow, would be a third of next year's debt. It barely gets us going in the right direction. You need to let your representatives know. You need to call them and write them that 50 billion is nothing anymore, 100 billion is nothing anymore, and that we need more. We need structural change. I'm going to turn the microphone over in just a minute to Senator Lee from Utah. But one of the things we're talking about is making the rounds, but it will make a difference what you do and how you can force the issue is we have to link raising the debt ceiling to something of value. It can't be a one-time token cut. We do need cuts, so I want to link cuts to the race of the debt ceiling, but we also need to transform the process. We need to force them to balance the budget by law. Yeah.